Hello, everyone. So good afternoon and welcome to the Kirby seminar. My name is Chaturaga Rodrigo and I'm with the viral immunology systems program of the Kirby Institute. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm joining from the, uh, the, the country of Darwal people today. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Now, before I start off, some housekeeping to uh, announce. So you can ask questions uh, during any times of this presentation by just clicking on the Q&A icon below, and we will take questions at the end of the presentation. And so it's my pleasure to introduce today, uh, Dr. Vincent Pedernana, who is joining us today from France. Uh, it's early morning in France, I guess. Um, so Vincent did his PhD in Paris under professors uh, Laurent Abel and Jean-Laurent Casanova. And he was working on the ge human genetic susceptibility to oncogenic viruses. After his PhD, he moved to a, a Welcome Center for Human Genetics in Oxford. Uh, where he worked on hepatitis C virus and the host, uh, the interaction between host and viral genomes. After that, he moved to Singapore uh, to work on uh, dengue virus infections. And that's the time when Vincent and I got, got to know each other and he worked in ASTAR. And then uh, he was uh, then recruited as a young team leader by the National Center of Scientific Research in France. So now he has moved back to France. Uh, so. It's my pleasure to welcome Vincent uh, to this Kirby seminar. And Vincent, it's over to you. Thanks, Chaturaka. So uh, I would like to start by thanking you and Braulio for inviting me for this uh, talk. I mean, it's a great honor for me to talk to you from France. So I'll start sharing my screen. So uh, the title of my talk today will be genetic determinants of human infections in the area of high throughput genomics. Um, I chose this title because historically, I've been interested in understanding the genetic, um, the observed variability in the response to infections. And most people used to look at the host side of it. Um, and especially uh, nowadays at the genetic side. So, why when we get exposed to the virus, we get infected, and why do we develop a disease? Um, and that's what I've done um, over the last 10 decades, um, exploring different um, viruses. And um, for my today's talk, I will have a special focus on hepatitis C virus infection. Um, um, would like to start by uh, presenting with this infection and this virus, because I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. So HCV is very peculiar. When you get infected, um, you may develop an acute infection or you may not develop it. And among the people who are infected, a proportion of them would, will spontaneously clear the virus. But most of the infected people will develop chronic uh, hepatitis C. So that infection will remain asymptomatic for many years, maybe decades. And then some people might develop a cirrhosis and some people with cirrhosis might develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, there is now a treatment that is very efficient against most forms of chronic hepatitis C. And at the time of um, my PhD, there was no treatment and chronic EPC was a, a quite um, bad disease. So HEPC is caused by the infection of hepatitis C virus. And there is several uh, genotypes of that, of that virus. Um, the colors here on the left represent the different genotypes and their distribution over the world. Um, this is not a highly prevalent infection in most of the countries. It's about um, 2% in most um, northern countries, and it switched some high prevalence in um, some specific countries like Egypt or um, Pakistan due to a specific uh, court effect. 
um, these different viruses uh, strains are quite similar and their difference i mean their genetic difference which up to like 30 percent um in the in the worst case the work i've been doing on uh, hepatitis c virus uh, took place in the uk where the most prevalent genotype is genotype 3 and it's believed to be originating from uh, southeast asia indian and, and pakistan probably due to uh, migration uh, back in the 50, 1950s um just a few words about transmission hep c is transmitted through contaminated blood so mainly during um, blood transfusion for um, IDU or when the, um, with the use on unsterilized uh, medical tools. So one of, of the most striking discoveries um, on the side of the genetic susceptibility to infectious diseases has been made in uh, hepatitis uh, C virus infection. And actually, it was uh, performed with a GWAS. So um, this kind of plot uh, that you see here on my slide, I will um, show a lot of them. So if you're not familiar with them, on the left side, you have a, a p-value, which is the strength of the association. And on the right, on the um, x-axis, uh, you have um, the different chromosomes from one to uh, uh, sexual chromosomes and even uh, mitochondria here. In that example. And then each dot represents um, an association test between a, a SNP, a single uh, a variant on the human side, and um, our fine phenotype of internet, which here is the spontaneous clearance of the virus. And we observed a very strong association between SNPs located on chromosome 19 and a spontaneous clearance. So actually, people carrying the right genotype, in this case, a CCE genotype, are twice more likely to clear the virus. And it has also been uh, shown for uh, vi um, viral clearance under treatment. So these SNPs are allocated in a cytokine called uh, interferon lambda 4. And um, this cytokine is part of a um, a locus where there is four very similar uh, cytokines. And uh, interferon da 4 was uh, thought to be a pseudogen, but actually um, it's, it's more and more likely that it is not. And um, the, there is now different mutations that have been associated uh, with different uh, probability to clear the, the virus. So that uh, was what we thought was, uh, I mean, that, that was um, the, um, the start of, of the work on hepatitis C. But um, when you look at, at this uh, uh, figure here, you can think on the fact that, of course, when there is an infection, there is a host who gets infected. But there is also the pathogen with, with, with the, the cause of the infection. And uh, if you only look at the host side, then you missed half of the story. And because all the major steps leading to an infectious disease are controlled by both human and viral factors, if we explore only the host genome, then it will not be sufficient to explain the complete observed variability. So, since the host and pathogen determine together the outcome of the infection, then no genetic variants alone in the host or in the pathogen should be considered harmful uh, without taking into account the, the other uh, variants into context. And now there have been, over the last 10 years, let's say, very uh, uh, high breakthrough um, technical and statistical um, in next generation sequencing. And it is now feasible for a reasonable, reasonable price to explore the entire uh, repertoire of host and various interactions. And 
this work uh, actually has actually been proposed uh, by uh, Jack Feli um, first in Lausanne. And this is um, this come from one of the first publication on what is now called genome to genome analysis. So there is a, a free way interaction when uh, if we look at the association between human genetic variation and a phenotype of interest, for example, HCV equivalence or uh, HCV viral load, we can do a GWAS that will show the impact of human variation on a specific clinical outcome. Or by sequencing the virus, which is uh, now more feasible than it was before, we can also look at the impacts of all the HCV variation on that specific clinical outcome. And that would be a uh, viral of patho pathogen device. And I will uh, show uh, some example of that um, towards the end of my talk. But what we can also do is look at the interaction or, or genetic association between human genetic variants and, and pathogen genetic variants. And by doing a joint analysis of, of these variants. And here we can think of the viral sequence variation to be an intermediate phenotype that will be closer to the potential uh, causal host polymorphism than the clinical outcome uh, like viral load or, or, or the disease phenotype, as I said before. And it will allow us to detect more subtle associations that could be blurred uh, due to different environmental uh, influence if we look at the clinical outcome. So this is expected to be more powerful and less biased than a classical GWAS on a clinical outcome. So what uh, we've been thinking on hep C um, infection was uh, this working hypothesis. Since uh, infection is often asymptomatic and the patient remain chronically infected, then the virus may adapt to the immune system environment of uh, the host. And if that hypothesis is correct, then we should observe within the viral genome uh, footprints of uh, the host immune system. And these footprints would then give us some insight into the HCV pathogenesis. So what uh, do I think of, or what did we think of when we were talking about um, footprints? And here I give a very uh, classical and maybe the easiest example of what um, it is expected to be a human virus interaction. And that's a HLA uh, uh, example. So after the viral infection, there will be a, uh, um, an expression of viral protein in the cell. And when the immune response is normal, then the viral protein will be fragmented. And some of these fragments might be presented by the HLA system, recognized by a T cell, uh, and then trigger um, the, uh, an immune reaction. But if a viral mutation occurs, then there will be uh, an expression on the mutated viral protein. And if by uh, chance this uh, mutation occurs in a, in a peptide that is usually rec rec recognized by HLA, then it will not be presented. And uh, the absence of representation will not trigger the immune response. And thou, uh, that's how we expect the virus to escape uh, the immune response. And that particular viral mutation will then be associated with a specific HLA, and that will be the footprints we are looking for. Um, so very briefly, I explained you the method. It's a quite simple method. It's, so we, we take the wall, we, we, we do wall genome sequencing on the virus. And then on the human side, we decided to be wall genome genotyping. So we don't have the full sequence, but we sequence some specific SNPs that are supposed to uh, capture the whole human variations thanks to the linkage equilibrium. And then by performing 
uh, statistical tests, um, we can have a map of all the genome to genome interactions. So if uh, you think of the number of viral variants that we can have in the uh, viral genome and the human variants, we performed in our case 3 billion tests. So there is um, obviously an issue of uh, multiple testing uh, that has been taken uh, into account by different methods. Um, in one of the work we published, um, we did Bonferroni correction, which is uh, very uh, conservative. And in one of the other paper we published, we, we did um, a false discovery rates correction, which is less conservative and allows us to discover more uh, potential association. And about the statistical test, um, it um, could be a simple uh, chi-square test, but in that case, we will not take into account the um, human population structure and the viral uh, population structure. So we decided to um, run a logistic regression test, including human uh, principal component in the uh, in yeah, as covariates as well as uh, viral principal components. So uh, so far, there have been uh, four different uh, pathogens uh, that have been explored with this uh, genome to genome uh, approaches. The first one developed by uh, Jack Fillet and uh, Ivan Barter in in Lausanne was an HIV. Then uh, together with colleagues in Oxford, we uh, explore this on hep C uh, infection. And uh, lately, uh, the team of Jacques Fillet also um, did an analysis on Hepstein Barr virus. So these three viruses are uh, chronic infections. Um, and so far, no acute infection has been um, explored with that method. And concerning a bacteria, only one a study uh, so far has been published. Uh, in, it's on Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, one of the issues with bacteria is the size of the genome, uh, which also uh, obviously increases the uh, number of tests performed and could uh, be uh, potentially uh, problematic. And um, I forgot to add that very recently, there's been another uh, publication um, trying to to do this uh, to to use the same approach, but it was not completely whole genome, and it was on um, a malaria infection. So, um, just in a few words, uh, because it was the first study on, on the subject um, on HIV. So, uh, when uh, you perform uh, a GWAS on uh, HIV viral load then there, there is uh, not much uh, human SNPs associated with viral load. Um, as you can see on this slide, the dashed horizontal line represents the, the significant threshold. And there is, on that study, only uh, one hit on the HLA that is uh, significant, but uh, with a, um, just significant p-value, let's say. But uh, on the B panel underneath, the same study has been uh, performed, but instead of testing the HIV viral load as an outcome, um, HIV uh, amino acid variants were tested. And you can see here that it's a huge, a significant peak on the HLA uh, side uh, with a p value uh, almost close to, to 10 to minus 70 which is really huge. So um, this was the first confirmation of, uh, of the interest of testing um, genetic pathogen genetic variants rather than a clinical outcome in, in for infectious diseases. And then um, the same team explored um, how, how much of the hop cell variability in the viral load was due to um, HIV variants alone. Um, here, uh, among epitopes that are known or on the whole genome, uh, on the cell uh, row. And, and it seems that about 25% of 
the observed variability is explained by viral mutations. And if you consider HLA, then only 8% of all the variants explained is explained uh, by HLA variants. So it means that most of the variability is due to um, HIV variants and, and not to HLA variants. And once again, it shows that um, it's really important to take into account the virus variants as well as the human variants to explain the observed variability in a clinical outcome. So um, the work we've done in Oxford was done on hep C infection, and that's what I will uh, develop mostly during my talk. Um, we, uh, we started this study um, in 2014 when uh, Gilead started a, trial, a clinical trial called uh, the Boson study, where uh, patients were treated with uh, sofosbuvir, which, is, which was uh, a new uh, antiviral treatment against hep C. And we were really lucky that Gilead uh, uh, um, uh, uh, performed the study, but included us um, academics uh, among uh, the, the researchers that were uh, allowed to explore a different um, a project on, on that specific cohort. And uh, so we, to, to avoid most of the population stratification, both in the human side and, and um, virus side, we focused on on patients with uh, white ancestry, chronically infected with uh, HCV of genotype 3A. And then later on, we also included 74 patients from a program called Extended Access Program, which was a, a, a clinical trial based in the UK, included patients with decompensated liver. And that's summed to a total of about 500 patients for which we have um, genetic data on the human genome and also world genome uh, virus sequence data. So let me uh, say it again, for each patient, we, we have the genome of the patient and also the genome of the virus that um, infects that specific patient or the genome of the population of viruses that infect the patient. So we did a genome to genome analysis and uh, this figure here represents um, a lot of work in just one figure. And I, I will guide you through this. So on the left side, uh, it's the, the viral genome is represented um, uh, and each uh, alternative color is a different um, proteins our, our genes on the viral uh, genome. And on the right side, um, the human uh, genome is represented and each alternative color represents a different chromosome from one to 22. And then each line uh, between the human genome and the viral genome represents an association between a specific human variant and a specific uh, viral variant. And here we represented in gray any association that showed a p-value of less of 10 to minus uh, five after a Bonferroni correction. And in blue, we represented all the significant uh, associations that, uh, that uh, all the significant associations, sorry, after a Bonferroni correction. So actually, there was uh, two sites on the human genome that were significantly associated with uh, viral variants. One was really expected, and that's the HLA uh, regions, and HLA corresponds to the adaptative, Im uh, adaptive immunity, sorry. And uh, we expected to find this uh, footprint as explained uh, earlier. But also we found one of the association in the interferon lambda 4 gene, um, interferon lambda 4, as I, I mentioned earlier, is uh, innate immunity. And that gene was, uh, has been shown to be really important in HIV uh, infection. So um, 
it was quite interesting to see that we could uh, uh, find the same uh, regions than, than the one we expected to find. Um, so here I present the, the highest or the most significant associations that was found found in um, in uh, between a, a, a viral variant and an HLA uh, variant. And actually, what is really interesting is that this um, association is located in an epitope and the hepatitis C virus uh, genome. So the epitope is uh, here in, the, is in this green square. And the mutation that we observe to be associated is a mutation from Y to F, so from a tyrosine to phenylalanine um, with uh, HLA A0101. And uh, the, the even more interesting is that this, this mutation is located at the, towards the end of the epitope, which is known to be uh, the region that binds to the HLA. And actually, uh, what has been shown by others is that that specific mutation, I mean, uh, sorry, that specific, specific epitope uh, is presented by HLA0101. So if the patient has not any HLA0101 uh, in his uh, pool of HLAs, then there is no binding of um, that epitope and uh, HIV can escape uh, immune response. And that's what we show here that uh, about the same proportion of patients had a Y and a F at that position among carrier, among, among patients non carrying HLA0101. But if we look at the patients carrying HLA0101, then only four patients had a Y at that position, and a Y triggers the immune response. So HIV actually, HIV actually tried to escape uh, uh, HLA-Z1-Z1 presentation by mutating to F uh, among uh, patients uh, chronically infected by FC. And actually, we see here, here where uh, among patients with HLA-0101, most of the patients had an F at that position. And it has been shown that this particular mutation, F, uh, impairs the binding to the HLA pool. So that's a very interesting footprint. And uh, by doing this genome-to-genome -genome analysis, we can actually map all the HLA footprints in a single experiment. And on this um, Manhattan plot, what is shown on the X axis is the uh, viral genome from uh, C to NS5B. And all the dots above the uh, dotted lines here at uh, about 10 to minus 5 are significant associations between viral variants and HLA alleles uh, in our cohort. And when we sum up all the viral variants, we observe that about 5% of the viral variants tested were associated with HLA alleles. So in this single investment, we, 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 we mapped most of the HLA epitope, uh, of the um, HV epitopes binding to HLA. Um, then we move forward to the specific association between uh, interferon lambda 4 and a, um, a viral variant. And uh, what was previously shown on the on the genome to genome map that I chose earlier is this association here in NS5B. Uh, and I will come back to this specific association later. But once again, if we look at uh, this Manhattan plot, and on the x axis is the viral genome again, and on the uh, y axis, uh, the strength of the association, we can see that there, is, um, there are many associations between interferon lambda 4 and viral variants. And again, it's striking because 5% of all the viral genome tested was associated with interferon lambda 4 SNP. And it means that a single gene that is, has had as much impact and as all the HLA alleles on viral variation. And 
um, let me remind you that this single gene is uh, thought to be um, linked to innate immunity and not adaptive immunity. And it's also, it's also striking, and we do not understand yet how um, interferon lambda for uh, how interferon lambda for genes uh, has such an impact on the viral variations. Um, so, what's uh, quite interesting too is that the study we performed in these five or patients was later on uh, replicated by another uh, study. And this time on much more patients because the study included uh, more than, uh, about 9,000 patients. And in this study, they also found that uh, many, many viral variants were associated with uh, interferon lambda 4 um, uh, uh, gene. And uh, not only uh, this uh, association was found um, among uh, the geno HCV genotype 3, but also in HCV genotype 1A and 1B. And um, it seems that uh, no association was found uh, with genotype 2B, but it is possible that the sample size was too small, um, at least in this cohort, to find any uh, significant association. And this a uh, widespread impact on interferon lambda 4 was also um, identified uh, among uh, patients of uh, Caucasian or white origin here on the right of this uh, graph, but also in a patient from Asian origin. Um, and it was not found in patients with African origins, um, which um, might be due to the fact that a patient with uh, African origin usually tend not to present um, the specific uh, genotype in interferon lambda 4 that is known to be associated with uh, HCV clearance. But uh, what was really interesting for us is that the results we obtained in a small cohort was then replicated in a very large cohort. And it confirmed that uh, a small cohort of about 500 patients is sufficient uh, to find uh, many potential associations using this uh, technique of genome to genome analysis. Um, so I presented you before uh, this genome to genome analysis, but I will now uh, focus on a specific, um, on the specific impact of uh, uh, viral variations and human variation on viral load. And we did that uh, to try to better understand um, the hep C pathogenicity among our patients. So in, in the, the, the most uh, associated variant with interferon lambda 4 was located in the gene uh, called NS5, in the viral gene called NS5B, and at the position 2414. And the mutation is actually a mutation from uh, N amino acid to uh, S amino acid. And there was a few other uh, different uh, amino acids at that position too. But among our patients, we observed that patient with a N at that position had higher viral load than patient with a S at that position. So what we then did is that we performed an in vivo uh, analysis where we infected liver cells with different uh, form of uh, the uh, hep C virus, uh, either uh, N here in red or S uh, in uh, blue. And then we observed the viral load after uh, several uh, hours within the cells. And what we can see is that uh, the N uh, Virus, I mean, viruses carrying a N at that position had higher viral loads in vivo than viruses carrying a S at that position. Uh, at this position, um, and what was uh, uh, even more striking is that um, patients with 
a different phenotypes. So, sorry, let, let me rephrase it. Um, so on, on, on these plots, you have um, the different uh, viral variants at that specific position. And here is a S patient with a lower viral load than uh, N uh, or non S patient. And then uh, if we uh, stratify by human genotypes at the interferon lambda 4 gene, either CC, TC, or TT, among patients uh, among patients carrying a virus with an S at that position, then we observe that a patient with a CC has higher viral load, have very higher viral load than patient with TC and higher viral load than patient with TT. And that's a replication of uh, what was known before our study. Um, but uh, among patients with non S at that position, we observe no difference of the viral load uh, between the different human genotypes. And so this result shows that a viral mutation can change the association between the viral load and a human gene. And in this specific example, it illustrates the importance to simultaneously explore the host and the viral genome to better understand the genetics of uh, this infection. Because uh, as, as you understand, if we are not uh, stratified by uh, the viral mutation, then we would not have observed this difference um, in association. So um, to summarize uh, the work we've done on hep C infection, we observed that uh, host HLA had a strong impact on uh, the viral amino acids and about 5% uh, of all the amino acid variations were uh, due to um, HLA alleles. But a host interferon lambda for alone had also a very strong impact on um, the viral variations. We also showed that a specific interaction between the human variation and a viral variation um, controls the viremia. And it seems then uh, during chronic infection, uh, HCV evolves to avoid the host immune response, uh, as this has been shown uh, by the specific uh, HLA footprint uh, example that we, we previously showed. But the specific biology on how interferon lambda 4 makes uh, HCV evolve uh, remains unknown um, now. So it shows that a systematic genetic analysis of uh, human and pathogen genomes allows insight into the pathogen evolution and immune response mechanisms that will then relate to the clinical uh, relevant phenotype. And uh, what's remarkable about uh, this genome to genome analysis is that it has a gain of uh, statistical power, which results from uh, the use of a molecular uh, phenotype here, the, the viral variation, rather the, than the use of a, a clinical genotype, uh, phenotype. Sorry. Um, this work, uh, I mean, this kind of analysis um, is uh, really uh, useful in infectious diseases, as we have uh, two genomes and uh, cannot be extended to, to other chronic uh, diseases, such as diabetes, for example, where we only have. Uh, one genome. But what's uh, quite interesting is that uh, it has been shown uh, recently that um, there was some uh, footprints of cancer genetic variations due to the um, uh, human genome. And so we can also imagine to perform this uh, type of analysis uh, for um, uh, um, in the context of, of cancer. Um, I realized that uh, my thoughts were preferred than I thought, uh, but it's quite, which we'll have more time for questions. Uh, I would like to thank all the patients or the families that uh, made this work uh, feasible, and also um, Gilead and the Stop HCV Consortium from which uh, most of the work uh, originated. And uh, obviously, it's not something that I've done alone, but with uh, my colleagues in Oxford, in particular, uh, Azim 
Ansari and Chris Spencer, and uh, colleagues from uh, Glasgow, uh, in particular uh, Connor Bamford and John uh, McLogan, and colleagues from uh, Switzerland, uh, Jack Fele, Itzvan Barta, and Nimisha uh, Chateauverde. And thank you all uh, for attending uh, my talk, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Vincent, for that very informative talk. And if you have any questions for Vincent, please um, type them in uh, in the q and You can click on the Q&A icon and type your questions in. So I'll get started, Vincent, with a question. So I suppose in from the viral perspective, you just use the consensus sequence of the virus in your analysis. So how complicated do you think uh, it would be to incorporate the, all the SNP data that comes out of Illumina, for example, for all, all the variants per subject in your analysis? Yes, that's correct. So um, we uh, decided to use the consensus sequence uh, because uh, it was easier uh, for a first analysis. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, feasible to extend it to um, all the variants uh, that, that come from uh, Illumina sequencing. Um, so let's imagine that, I mean, let's imagine that at a position, uh, instead of uh, using um, the most frequent variant, we try to test for all the variants that are present at this position. Um, if we have a reasonable number of variants, uh, let's say, two, three, four, then it should be feasible depending on, on the sample size, because then you will have four tests rather than one. Um, um, another approach could also be to test for uh, the proportion of variants. Uh, that's something that um, it's commonly done uh, with human GYCs, where instead of using uh, genotypes, uh, we use the uh, uh, proportion of each genotypes as uh, a variable. So um, it's very feasible, but depends on the sample size. Thanks, Vincent. So I have a comment to add there because we also had a much smaller sample size, but we look at the Illumina SNP data and we quantify the variability of Shannon entropy. And then we correlated with the exact interferon lambda for CC genotype. And we found that the Shannon entropy for the mutations was quite high in people who carried that CC. Uh, phenotype with the interferon lambda 4. So that's something that I wanted to add on as a, which, which fits with your observations there. Um, so we have questions from Professor Andrew Lloyd. Uh, so Andrew is asking, um, all the infections you mentioned, uh, the hepatitis C is, is chronic HIV and hepatitis C. So do you think you have uh, adequate time to observe a similar footprint in uh, G2G footprint in acute infections? For example, say dengue. Yep, um, so that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> any question is good, but in the sense that we don't know yet, uh, since uh, this work has not uh, ever been done in a, in a acute infection. But what's really interesting is that uh, people looking at uh, dengue variations during acute infection observed an accumulation of variations uh, uh, in the short time of the infection, actually. So the virus replicates and will mutate. It's an RNA virus, which is highly mutating. Um, so will the virus adapt to the immune system in this short time? I don't know. But I'm sure that we will at least have enough um, uh, variations to test for it. And, and just to add to that, so we are going to find that out soon. So we are working with Vincent on a project where we got a lot of uh, human genome sequence with dengue and we all have the viral genome. So the human genomes are just being finished. So we'll know the answer to that question quickly uh, within the next few months. So there's a question from Braulio. For identification of footprints, is it required? Uh, do you need a prospective characterization of pathogen genomes or a cross-section characterization would be? Uh, good enough. Uh, sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Can you, can you uh, repeat? Yeah, so what's written? So Braulio, do you want to ask the question? You can unmute your mic if you want. Probably not. That facility is not available. So it's uh, it, the question is asking for identification of footprints. Uh, do you need prospective characterization of pathogen genomes? Or he's asking whether you need longitudinal samples from like, uh, you know, 
for at the beginning of the infection, two months later, three months later, likewise, multiple okay. genomes. Or just one time point is good enough, yeah. I understand, sorry. Uh, so, so what we've done was uh, cross-sectional, um, and uh, it's enough uh, to, to discover footprints. Let's say if the virus had enough time to evolve. For chronic infection, it's most often, often the case. Uh, for FC infection, it's most often the case, as I explained, because the infection is asymptomatic and people discover that they have infection when they get sick. Um, and so the virus adds many years to evolve. Uh, for EPSI infection, um, for dengue infection, for example, um, uh, people come to the hospital when they're sick. And in the study we, we designed with uh, uh, Shaturaka, uh, it was the case. So the, the, the patients were already infected for a few days. So the virus had time to evolve. But what is even more interesting than the cross-section would be the longitudinal. So if we had more than one time point, then we can compare the footprints on the early infection to the footprints on the uh, late infection and see if the viral evolves due to specific uh, human mutation or if the viral does not evolve during, uh, during these two time points. It would mean that uh, the, the immune system is not responsible for the, um, I mean, there's, Patient-specific immune system is not responsible for the human for these viral variations, but the broad uh, human immune system as a, a general population would be responsible. Thanks, Vincent. And there's another question asking. Um, now you were talking about interactions between individual SNPs uh, between the human genome and the viral genome, but we also know that different SNPs interact with each other on the viral genome. Uh, epistasis. So do you think um, such relationships can, can be uncovered by genome to genome analysis or perhaps an extension of it? Um, so that's, that uh, specific question uh, was one of the issue of our analysis. We were wondering whether uh, the association that we observed between one human variant and several uh, viral variants were due to this uh, epistasis or, or or let's say also um, uh, compensative mutations where, where on the viral side, we have a mutation that will be compensated by another mutation to, to maintain the fitness of the virus. And actually uh, we tested for specific correlation between uh, all, the, all the viral uh, variants that we had in our cohorts. And we did not observe an, an enrichment between the viral variants uh, associated with specific genes, human genes, and, and the viral variant known associated with human genes. So um, I don't think that it can be a way to, I mean, at least on FC, it was not a way to, to uh, find specific uh, epistasis um, within the virus. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, there's another question. Uh, it is intriguing that interleukin-28 polymorphisms um, uh, another interferon lambda gene are related to therapeutic responses to. So it is intriguing that inter interleukin 28 polymorphisms um, are linked to, uh, which another interferon lambda gene is also linked to therapeutic responses to hepatitis C. Uh, and another one you showed that here is linked to spontaneous clearance and, and, and human genetic polymorphisms. Do you want to speculate on the likelihood of a common defense mechanism here? Yep. So um, interferon lambda 4 is a uh, uh, new uh, terminology for uh, interferon 28B, um, which is, I, I think, uh, the, the, the gene that we are talking here. So this is the same interferon lambda gene as the one I mentioned. Um, so uh, it seems, at least our understanding now, is that it seems that uh, among patients with uh, the deleterious interferon lambda for uh, genotype, there is um, a steady expression of this interferon lambda 4, which uh, triggers a latent low-level immune response. And 
the presence of this latent uh, immune response seems to decrease um, the viral load of uh, Hep C, Hep C viral load. So, um, in in the sense of the so I'm speculating, right? In the sense that the, the this low viral load will not uh, be sufficient to trigger an uh, strong immune response, uh, thanks to a peak of interferon lambda of uh, uh, interferon lambda and interferon alpha. Um, and so um, viral, viruses will try to have to, to mutate to to a, a form that. Uh, Allow them to, to stay at a low viral load and not a high viral load. And this will be due to the uh, steady immune uh, response that is triggered by the presence of interferon number four. Where in the case of um, patients without uh, this interferon number four, there is no uh, steady expression of cytokines. And then the virus uh, will manage to. to to have a form that uh, present a uh, high viral load, and this will uh, then trigger a strong immune response. Yes, thanks, Vincent. Um, so there's been a question by David who says, uh, David was asking, uh, is any consideration required for genome to genome statistics based on RNA versus DNA based viruses? Uh, because you mentioned EBV versus HCV, but David also says that Andrew's uh, question and the answer you gave it partially answered that question. Uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, do you think the, this genome to gene analysis, is it easier to do on uh, DNA to DNA versus RNA, RNA to DNA? Now you mentioned about the bacteria and the genome is longer, so I guess you have that, that disadvantage on comparing two DNA genomes. But if it's DNA versus RNA, despite the genome being shorter, but you get a lot of mutations. So is it an advantage or a disadvantage in that sense? Yes. Um, so we, we need the virus to be, uh, uh, to have variations, to be, to be able to perform the analysis. Mm. And uh, DNA, ten, DNA viruses tend to, to be uh, less uh, variable than uh, RNA viruses due to, to the presence of, uh, of uh, strains that, that allow them to correct uh, uh, during replication. And the, and the uh, uh, polymerase is also less prone to errors. Um, so I don't think that uh, it's an issue as long as there is uh, variations among the, among the virus, but we can only discover associations with uh, variations that exist. Um, and the length, I mean, yeah, the, the length of the, the genome um, is an issue in the, in the sense of, of multiple testing. But we, since we, we're working in a field where we're generating hypotheses and, and we don't uh, claim for sure that uh, this is a causal gene or, or there is a, a defi definite uh, association, then uh, we can work with. Um, uh, false discovery rates and um, increase uh, the rates to to make more hypotheses, um, even if we have um, let's say borderline significance. So I don't I don't really think that um, that would be an issue. Yeah. Um, so far, let's say that the sample size for bacterial genome to genome analysis has been too small to to really discover anything. Okay, thanks, Vincent. Uh, so I think we have another question from Andrew. Uh, so he's asking, I guess the answer to this would be speculative. Uh, he's asking for lethal infections like HIV. Presumably the footprint of the virus on the host could be discerned if the host genome could be sampled over a sufficient time frame uh, to discern evolutionary change. Um, for example, like centuries. Uh... So he's asking for lethal infections like HIV. Yeah. If you sample a long, a long enough time period, like for example, like centuries, uh, do you think the, the these relationships would become more apparent? Um, yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, 
I don't know, actually, will, I mean, probably, probably it's, it's uh, similar to what we can expect from uh, the viral side. Uh, if we have a longitudinal study on Newman, mm. then we, we might indeed observe uh, um, an, an, a selection on, of the virus on the human, uh, on the human genome. And, and yeah, I'm thinking as I speak, and I think that, for example, um, HCV uh, footprints on the human genome seems to be linked to interferon lambda 4, but it's known that uh, HCV originated about 1,000 years ago, but uh, interferon lambda 4 mutations is uh, older than that. So there was another virus that mm -hmm. uh, impacted the genome on that position. So this footprint is observed now. Um, if we were able to sample enough people from ancient times or mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the future, we, we might be able to, 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 to know more about the virus that uh, made that footprint on, on the HIV genome. So yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. Uh, Andrew? And I saw Andrew has left another comment. COVID may be creating a footprint now, <laughs> which we might say in the future. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Why not? I mean, it has already been shown that some hmm. human genetic variations are associated with uh, COVID severity. Yeah. So I think we've come to the end of our uh, allocated time. So I'd like to thank Vincent. And I'd like to thank the audience also for a very engaging discussion. So thank you, Vincent. And thanks Thank everyone. You. And I'm closing this webinar.